I'm James Jolly and I'm thrilled to be sitting down and chatting with some of today's most inspiring artists. Welcome to this episode of Music Makers, a series in which we meet some of the most talented musicians on the planet. Today's guest is a singer who's risen to the top of her profession with remarkable speed. Born in South Africa and trained in Milan, Pretty Yende is a trailblazing soprano who's conquered many of the great operatic stages of the world. The possessor of a beautiful voice, a superb technique, and a winning stage presence, she's undoubtedly a major star of today. I'm looking forward to hearing about her musical journey and finding out what has shaped Pretty Yende into the music maker that she is. Thank you so much for joining us um, on the morning after an opening <laughs> night. I'm happy to spend my morning with you. <laughs> so how was it last night? This was the first first night of Magic Flute, Tsitsalba Flirter. You were singing Pamina. How was, how was the performance? It was really amazing. Um, it was also f uh, incredible to have, you know, such an incredible warmth from the audience, um, especially with the, you know, with the wonderful cast. It was absolutely an amazing night. And how long, I mean, do, do you come out of a first night with, you know, on a big high. I mean, how long does it take for you to kind of come back down to earth? <laughs> it takes a long time. Sometimes it depends on the role. For Pamina, it took me not so much yesterday. I actually was um, in bed around 2.30 a.m. But for example, if I do Traviata or Lucia, sometimes I'm still awake until 5 a.m. in the morning, so. But um, it does take some time to come down. And I mean, how do you find the actual sort of rehearsal stage of an, of an opera? I mean, I've talked to singers and they say, we really love rehearsals, we just love the camaraderie, the joshing around, but actually when it gets to opening night and the run starts, it kind of turns into work and we don't like it so much. I mean, what, what, how do you find the experience? For me, I've always found that the rehearsal period, I call it my sacred place. It's our sacred place where we actually learn, grow, explore, and, uh, you know, it's really our time to, to, to learn things that we can probably not um, able to do on stage because once you're on stage, it's uh, it's another mode of of, of learning. Um, so I enjoy very much the rehearsal uh, period because you find things that you never thought you, you know you could find. And if one is very wise, you you have to use that time to 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 explore what you have, what you can do, what you can learn from your colleagues, what's expected from you also from the conductor, from the director, and just the collaboration of the entire process can make you a, a better artist and most times also an amazing human being. Because I mean, the magic flute is, it's sort of slightly unusual in your repertoire in that it's one of the very few German roles you sing. Probably the only one. I was gonna say, <laughs> probably the only one. I mean, it's one of those operas that, that I think everybody loves because nobody has the same idea of what, what it's about. I mean, it's very difficult to say, apart from in the broadest terms, what the magic flute is about and what these kind of characters do, which I think possibly gives it its sort of, you know, its timeless quality that everybody loves it. Absolutely. I mean, yesterday, for example, the audience members was from like five-year-olds to, you know, maybe 95-year-old, and everybody was just laughing and enjoying the light and enjoying the journey of, of the magic flute itself, because the piece is quite beautiful. It has so many memorable mem uh, melodies as well, and it's quite well known, which is always nice when you're performing an opera that everybody sort of knows, because then you know that you're enjoying together, and, uh, you know, everybody sorts of wait for that moment, that, ah, I've been waiting for this moment. And so it's it's quite an, um, an, an amazing experience for me to sing her again because the first time I sang her was at the Metropolitan Opera House and then I left it for some time and then I sang it again in Geneva and this is the third time I'm revisiting her and I believe that I, I would like to sing more Mozart actually. I was going to say, does, is it, did you feel it's sort of good for the voice? Absolutely, or? it was like honey, it was like oh my god, feeling like this is so important because when you perform a lot, it's easy to tense up and tense up and tense up and tense up and not actually remember to release. And as I've been doing this, uh, this role now, I feel such an incredible release, relaxation in a way 
that I don't feel the, the tenseness. And so I'm able to evaluate the tension that has been developing in my body with the other roles that I've been doing, or also vocally, or psychologically, and physically. So um, to release those, those um, tensions that creep on when you perform a lot and you don't see them creeping on and then, and then they create some, some challenges as you go by. And so it's been interesting for me to see that when I now learn, uh, you know, try to sing phrases from the other roles that I've been doing, they feel so much easier. I'm like, what was I doing? <laughs> so it's wonderful to explore such Because the show. magic flute also has, a, has a, that lovely quality that you're singing with actually so many of the different characters. You know, in, in the kind of standard, should we say, bel canto or, you know, the Verdi repertoire, it's quite often you, yes. the kind of heroic tenor, the baddie baritone maybe exactly. and that's sort of it really Absolutely. whereas on magic flute you know you're, you're you know you're singing with tamino you're singing with papageno mm -hmm. queen of the night you know the whole the whole kind of cast almost she's she's absolutely incredible because she's able to connect with everybody um you know some sort of like a core but not like a core with other roles and it's quite interesting how she reacts with one character with Tamino and with Papageno or with the mother or with Zarastro and at the end of course uh, you know it's it's quite it's an interesting role actually also as far as an as an actress is concerned because you you get to find colors um, that um, show who she is and uh, also how everybody perceives her. And it's been interesting because with other characters, there's sort of like a common denominator in a way because she's from the beginning until the end. But this time she's there with that person and then she's gone and then she's there with the other person and then she's gone with monostatos and everybody. So it's been quite an interesting challenge for me because I also like very much acting to see how I relate and keep the arc of her in the show. Pamina obviously is a you know is, is a very central role for you in the Mozart and repertoire. Are there, are there, what other you, you mentioned that Mozart might be you know somewhat you'd like to explore a little bit more? I mean, have you eye on, uh, you have you eye on particular roles? Absolutely. I mean, I think I sang once Susanna in Los Angeles, but now I think in the core of my being, I would love to sing the Countess as the voice is growing and the repertoire is growing as well since I started singing Traviata. It feels like it's going to be the next step into the lyric repertoire. And of course, I think Donna Anna will be something interesting for me to do. Of course, character-wise, I think Donna Elvira is much more interesting, but I believe that I could, I could do both, either or. Uh, I, was I think that's always a very, that's a sort of temperament thing, isn't yes. it? You know, some singers are absolutely Donna Anna's and say, you know, I'm not interested in Donna Elvira at all, she's completely mad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then other singers saying, oh, I couldn't touch Donna Anna at all. <laughs> I think for me, it will be interesting to see how, um, because vocally both of them can sit quite yeah, comfortably. Yeah. But character-wise, it's always something that I always find interesting for me to do when I do a role, that what, what are the characteristics of that character that would make them interesting and how would it challenge me as an actress to actually bring them mm. to life. So that would be interesting. I was actually once offered Constanza as well. so. There are quite a few Mozart roles that I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to see in the future. And what about sort of concert work? I mean, there, you know, there's all these fabulous concert arias. Absolutely, absolutely. I love that. And also or or oratorios. There are quite a lot of oratorios mm. that he has written. And so um, if I do things right, I have quite exciting journeys ahead, repertoire-wise. If I don't do things too quickly or too late, I think I can have a long enjoyable, healthy career. I'm sure you will. <laughs> in every interview I've ever read with you, you know, people have always said, well, of course, it was the, it was the Lacme flower duet, in, as used in the British Airways advert, that kind of turned, turned on your music. And I was just thinking, actually, the timing of this is so perfect because there's a production of Lacme about to open in Paris right now with a, you know, with a French cast. So, right. you know, you can actually go and visit it and I see all the bits between all these incredible... <laughs> I mean, what, what was it about the, the sung operatic voice when you heard that duet that kind of fired your inspiration? When I look back and when I hear it, because I always hear it, I don't remember the picture. I remember um, years after looking for the picture, I couldn't see the picture, but the music I can still hear. It was something supernatural. 
I've always known love, I've always known joy, I've always known music. But when I heard that melody, that combination of those voices, in my soul, in my heart, I knew what it was. In my mind, in my intellect, I had no idea what it was. It's the power of the human voice. It's the beauty of the unity of different frequencies of human voices, that they hold one another, they envelop one another, and bring an incredible joy, love and peace, and okayness sensation that our physical world is not able to do. I mean, when you sing, are you, are you sort of conscious that what you want to give to your audience is beauty, and in giving them beauty, somehow uh, you are opening their eyes to some kind of truth? Honestly, there's no time to even Well, I was going to Because you have like more than thousand, thousand thoughts like running into your mind. You have to catch the conductor, you have to remember the words, you have to remember this, you have to remember that. And if there are any uncertainties or things that come out of nowhere, you have to know how to deal with them. But what has always centered me is to trust in the music that already it is able to do more than what I can actually intend to do. And I have to believe also that the way I have prepared as best as I can, the way I'm able as best as I can, and my gift is able to do much more than I can, you know, do myself or intend to do. And also it's interesting that ultimately all those elements, they end up working together to actually bring the intention that you wish as an artist that you could be able to do when you're on stage and performing. Because as an audience member, you know, you go into an opera house and you're there for two, maybe two and a half, three hours. And when you come out, you do feel changed. If it's been I mean, even, even a, a, you know, a not massively wonderful performance, but I mean a truly wonderful performance, you do feel a changed person. You, you have been exposed to this incredible genius, this incredible beauty. And in so many operas, so many sort of archetypal situations that actually touch you as a human being, because whether it's a, you know, whether it's a king having problems with his queen or his princess, actually you can relate to that as a human being. And it's yes. a really fundamental experience. It is. I've always said that it is actually the gift to all humanity, because it is something so precious that you and I don't have to speak the language. We don't have to know the ins and outs of the story. But when we are both in that space, me on the other end, you on the other end, we have a connection that happens beyond our physical world. It goes to a place where you and I meet and have a conversation. I say that music beyond the black and white notes, it has a language on its own. That's where your soul and my soul meet. And we are never the same. As I pour virtue into you through the music, through the composition, the costumes, the story, the possibilities of just me being there or on stage and availing myself with all my heart in that piece to bring something extraordinary we meet because we have that shared connection of the passion of the music. And that source is what makes us not the same when that evening ends. There are nights where you have extraordinary performances. I was taught this, um, that everything is sung perfectly. Everything is like note perfect from the beginning to the end. But some audience members go out and they're not touched. And I was exposed to another kind of music making where it might not be a perfect night, but when that singer just sang that one phrase, that person was changed forever. And I, I've always said, wished to make that kind of art because as I'm learning about the, the whole deal of performing is that it's always a balancing act about what you study and what you have and putting all of, all of those things together. And the experience that we as artists gain is always from the stage, which is the most dangerous place because we are so exposed. 
So we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. But in that, we have to have courage to trust that as we are all united in that space, we have that shared love of this music. And we are human beings first. And that's the connection. And as a singer, when you listen to a recording, do you tend to listen to sort of live recordings? Because that's the real, that's kind of what's really happening, rather than necessarily a sort of studio one where it's been tidied up. I mean, so many singers say, oh, well, you know, if I have to, I, you know, I don't mind warts and all. I want to hear what it sounded like that night on the stage, the risks they took, the danger they were prepared to, to face. I, I love that too, very, very much, because when I started recording too, I, I saw the difference um, of a live, performing, uh, live performance compared to a recording. Um, and those two are actually two different um, careers. <laughs> They're very, very different. And so I love to see the process of where the singer was and how they got to the, the product that was actually then presented. I remember when I was at the Academy of La Scala, I used to go to the Opera House and I would sit in from the first rehearsal to the last rehearsal on stage. And uh, I would see, like I would want to see what is this magic? What makes the audience go wow? Or what makes the audience go crazy and angry and boo and stuff like that? Because for me, it has always been a journey of um, learning and uh, it's interesting to see the process of an artist from the beginning of the piece and as they go through the rehearsals and solving problems and you know um, um, making their journey towards the actual performing, mm -hmm. performance. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you must have given many, many interviews sort of since the start of your career. And I suspect, and I don't know whether this is true, but I suspect they say, oh, pretty Yende, South Africa, let's talk about apartheid, without actually realising that you are a post-apartheid generation. Thank so, you. So what was the, I mean, you know, that was, that was your parents and your grandparents had to kind of live with that. But as somebody who, who sort of, you know, came to maturity after apartheid, was there a sort of sense of actually, I can achieve anything. You know, in theory, there's nothing holding me back. James, I love you so much for this right now, because I've always, I've always, I've always said, I don't know it. I wasn't born uh, in a sense of being exposed to it. My parents tried to, 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 to shell me in a way that I would not look at the person differently. And also I was from the small town, so all the things that were happening were happening in the big cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town. And so most people they don't understand that I don't know it. <laughs> and so I've always also said that it's been interesting for our generation that we are, um, you know, the, the, the product of hope. We are the, the possibility. We, we are the people who have had the possibility meeting time. And so there were many, many other of our South Africans who were extraordinarily talented, but they were not able to be given the opportunity to actually further their careers overseas. And so we are having this incredible privilege of taking every chance that was ever given to us seriously because most of the people who deserved, it, who deserved it before us, they were never given. So each time I, from then, I understood that I, I am not just, it's not just me, but it's so many people who see themselves in us as South Africans now enjoying this incredible uh, global stage um, presence on the opera. Um, and so it's really a privilege. And when I, embarked on the journey, I didn't think about all of those things. What was important for me was like, I've just found something. I want to know what it is. I need to know what it is. And that has never changed. But that quest resulted in what we are seeing now. Many people get inspired. Many people, you know, saying what has happened with all this talent from South Africa? And we all say it's always been there. It's just that we have the privilege of the possibility meeting time.
So when you went to Cape Town to sort of study, you know, knowing that this was a career you wanted to follow, I mean, who would have been your role models at that time? I mean, did you look to, I mean, was it a sort of colourblind role model thing or did you look to, because I, you know, when I think of back, you know, when you think back to the sort of early 60s, you know, you've got people like Leontine Price, Shirley Verrett, Grace Bunbury, or did you just look at opera singers regardless of their, their colour? Actually, when I was there, I wasn't even sure that I wanted it to be a career. I was still searching. I was still, you know, when I got to the University of Cape Town and I heard extraordinary voices, I was like, I don't belong here. I don't have that voice. Fortunately, I had a wonderful voice teacher, Virginia Davids, who encouraged me and um, inspired me to also, as much as I acknowledge and really um, uh, look at other people's um, gifts, um, I should not diminish mine. I should also look at my box and see what's inside and explore and learn and grow. And soon too, it will be just as extraordinary. And she was right. So because of my curiosity, I was looking at everything that can inspire me. Even before Maria Callas, it was not about color. It was about gifts. It was about the instruments, how they make art that made me uh, uh, inspired. And also, there were times though, as I grew, uh, when I was at the Academy of La Scala, I think, and I wondered why are there not so many um, black uh, singers singing bel canto? Because I believed they could. So maybe partly it was another inspiration after Maria, um, after Mirella Freni advised me to look into the bel canto repertoire, that it was like, oh, maybe I can actually, you know, embark on it. Because when I look at those incredible um, African American singers and also South Africans and Africans, I believed that they could have actually done an incredible um, contribution to the bel canto repertoire. Mm. So, so we, we just need to sort of fill in the gap between, you know, Cape Town and La Scala. So you, you, you had some amazing successes in, in competitions. And then you, how did the, 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 the sort of La Scala training started? Did they invite you or did you, did you say, that's where I want to go and study, as it were, at ground zero for opera? So when I was finishing my studies at the University of Cape Town, I realized that most of the people that they were extraordinary and who deserved to have international careers, they were not actually furthering their careers overseas. And I asked myself, why? Why are they not going? Because they deserve to go. And then I, I thought it could be financial constraints. Uh, remembering that I, before I wanted to be, uh, you know, to embark on this journey, I wanted to be an accountant. So the accountant in me came to life and thought, what can I do to get myself overseas? And I thought, instead of asking a huge amount of money to do an audition tour overseas, maybe I could just ask for one family to sponsor me a return ticket for an international competition. That way I'm exposed to most of the important people in the industry. So that's how I actually decided to enter international competitions. But I had to be very, very clear in my head that I'm not competing, I'm auditioning. I'm telling everybody that I've just found this, what do you think? And in doing that, it resulted in me winning all the competitions that I've done, which is something that I actually look back now and think it was because I was not there to make the other person smaller. I was there to present and I was there to also learn from them. And that was a big lesson because in this career, it's very important to be comfortable with your gift as well as with other people's gifts because you are always going to be surrounded with greatness and you have to be very comfortable with that. And so the first competition that I entered was the Vienna International, uh, Hans Gabor International Competition in Vienna, where I won every prize possible. I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, they're making a mistake. You know, I've, I'm just finding this, how is it that I'm good? How is it that I'm winning this? Because that person is much more better and stuff like that. But it must, but it must have been lovely, actually, you know, all that to one side, to suddenly think, I'm here, I'm in one of the great European operatic musical centres, and people like me. It was, but it was also scary. 
It was also scary because I had no intentions whatsoever to win. So I didn't think I could win. And so, but also affirming, very, very much affirming because I needed that. Because as I was at the University of Cape Town, I still doubted myself that I belong here. I belong here. It took a while to actually believe that truly I do belong here. And so one of the prizes that was uh, offered to me in that competition was an invitation to do the Young Artist Program at the La Scala Academy. And then I had also other invitations from Germany and here in France. And me back then, I thought, because everybody was like coming to me, agents saying, we're gonna make you a star, you're gonna be, and in my heart I was like, no, I don't want to be a star. I don't want to be a star. I want to learn. I want to learn this world so that I can make informed decisions because my gift, my responsibility. I don't want to blame you because of my ignorance uh, in, the long in the long run because I wasn't prepared to make informed decisions. So that resulted in me deciding to go to La Scala because I knew that if I go to La Scala, nobody will treat me as a star. In fact, it was my hiding place, <laughs> you know, because I knew if I went to Germany, they would make me to work immediately, and I wasn't ready to work. I needed to learn, I needed to grow, and I needed to be very much here in order to be able to actually know what exactly the pretty, the pretty journey hashtag means. And presumably also studying in La Scala means that Italian would become central to your, your life, and if you speak Italian, Absolutamente. You, you kind of, you, you know, that is the gateway into, into opera. Absolutely. You know, I had a mentor in South Africa, Angelo Cobato, and uh, he was the reason actually opera was possible in, in South Africa, and we, we, we really love him so much and thank him for, for that. And he used to say back then, pretty, you need to learn Italian. And I was like, ma sì, si, certo, lo so, grazie. But when I got to Milan, I knew exactly that actually, the kind of translation for musicians, you know, that I would use when I was having an Italian song uh, back then, when I would translate it from Italian to English to Zulu in order to actually know it in my essence, you know, uh, was important. It was only when I started speaking Italian, I understood what he meant. It was an incredible shift as an artist and it changed a lot of things to, to, for the mm. better. Was it, I mean, was it a tough education? There. It was in a sense that um, in South Africa I had one voice teacher, a vocal coach, and my, my mentor uh, at the time, director Angelo Cobato. So they would have meetings about us. So they would say, there, we have this student, how can we help her? You know, she's doing well there, not so well there. And together they would actually come up with a plan for that particular student. But then when I got to the academy, I had 12 people who were all amazing, but the information was so overwhelming that at, po at some points I got very uh, confused because I was not so used to that in order to process the information. And, and, and so that's why I decided to hold on to some competitions as well, just to see if I was still doing well. Hence, I entered the Operala competition in Moscow and there again, I won everything. <laughs> So if one looks at your, your, your repertoire, um, there's a lot of bel canto, there's a lot of Rossini in there. I mean, that seems to me, you know, if you, if you can master bel canto, if you can master bel it's very exposed. I mean, in a way, it's not like singing, you know, Puccini, where you're singing on a kind of wonderful sea of orchestral sound. And um, I mean, if you can master that, it seems to me that you've kind of got the building blocks to sing moving into Verdi and, and, and beyond. I mean, what drew you to that particular repertoire? So it was Mirella Freni's advice when I got to the academy. I think I was like 20, 21, 23 or something like that. And when she heard my voice, she said, Pretty, you have a unique instrument. It's flexible, quasi naturale, she would say. And then she said, of course, you're going to sing the big repertoire but I would advise you to learn bel canto. That way you learn how to breathe, you learn phrasing, you learn interpretation, and you learn, you know, balance of, of, of vocal registers, you know. 
And of course, she was a great, insp uh, you know, um, in inspiration in that because she was an exemplary as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a person who sang healthily and so long. And she sang Mozart and she sang bel canto and then eventually the big repertoire. So I took her, her advice and uh, that's what drew me to the bel canto repertoire. But what was interesting is that when I started to sing the first phrases, the very first um, aria I, I took was actually Ipuritani's medicine. And when I sang that part, that whole thing in my heart, it was like, ah, oh, it, it feels good. And I knew that, okay, this is great. But then when we got to the cabaletta, <laughs> then I knew that I had a challenge to learn how to, you know, all the coloraturas and the high notes, because before I could hardly sing a high C. So I had to learn how to, you know, extend the, 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 the range. And luckily I got very much help with that with um, Mariela de Villa in Roma. And so, and also what I had learned in South Africa, so to balance the, the, the two. But it was a lot of hard work, which I'm very grateful for because as I'm moving and growing and looking into bigger repertoire and Eventually, Verdi is going to be the core of my career as well as Puccini. But all the principles that I've learned from Bel Canto are going to be so needed for Verdi. I realized that already just, just singing Traviata. And it must have been nice to encounter people like uh, Mirella Freni and Mir Mariella Devia, who are you know, big stars, but both deeply generous people because you know there's a temptation to assume and it may be correct that you know actually the big stars are not that generous with their their sort of their time and their advice no i've been very fortunate i've i've met quite a few of of the people that were really an inspiration for me when I was in South Africa. I would go to the library and I would see a recording of René Fleming, Mariela de Villa, Mirella Freni, Renata Scotto, Montserrat Caballé, Joan Sutherland, Maria Callas. Of course, I never met Maria Callas and Joan Sutherland, but I met Montserrat Caballé, Mir uh, Mirella Freni, Mariela de Villa, Scotto, and, uh, and René Fleming. And it has been such an incredible inspiration to see them live and seeing their generosity and their wish for me that all could be well with me. Because uh, if you look at the Freni career, I mean, there are certain, you know, I can sort of, when I was thinking, when I was coming, you know, planning or doing my research for this interview, I was thinking, who is a singer who is quite similar in terms of repertoire and the way that she handled her career? And, and you know, I can't help feeling that if you looked at the Freni career, actually that's, that's a very nicely handled Absolutely. career, you know, from Mozart into Verdi, Puccini, and I mean, you know, some, some big roles by absolutely, the end. Absolutely, absolutely. She was extraordinary. And we have had uh, an incredible uh, fortune to have such artists that we can look up to. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you talked early on about, you know, acting and, and being on stage. I mean, you know, you are a wonderful creature to see on stage. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you just, you are a very natural actress. I mean, where did that come from? I mean, was that something, you know, as a little girl, you used to kind of, you know, did acting emerge then? So it was interesting for me to find out that actually I loved acting more than anything. Um, I remember when I was in high school, um, we would have like maybe an English class and we would have to do a piece of acting of some sort. I remember that I used to enjoy that very, very much. And so when opera came to, to, my, to my life, it was interesting for me to have these two worlds meeting together. And uh, I'm very grateful for that because it is a big part of performing and artistry. Uh, you know, we are now expected more to, to act, to bring these actors to life and these characters to life because of the influential of uh, cinema and broadcasts. And so it is an even greater challenge for us not to just think about singing perfectly, but we are expected to jump and sing high notes and jump and sing E flats and jump and sing coral or tours, lie down. Or lie down <laughs> and upside down or being lifted up and singing high E flat. And so 
it is quite interesting to see how we are now also developing extra strength and extra wisdoms and skills to be able to meet those demands on us. Sometimes it's for our good and sometimes it actually hinders us. But in the long run, I believe that I'm going to be very grateful looking back that I was able to do something even in those circumstances. Because I always think it must be fascinating for an opera singer that, you know, you, you, know, you may be singing three or four violettas over the course of, say, two years in four completely different productions. Yes. And, and possibly four completely different conceptions of the character. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is a very, very um, important lesson that I'm learning, that even if there are those different concepts, the core of the story is still her. So when I have that base, even if I'm in a high heel wearing a gold dress, or <laughs> I'm in a costume, like period costume, of course body language changes, but the instrument is still one, the person is still one. I can be perceived differently because I'm dressed differently, but the core, if I hold on to that, I'll be able to manage it. Because that is one of the, I mean, that is one of the extraordinary things about opera. You know, it started, you know, almost, you know, about 400 years ago, and right from those very start, first operas, we were kind of connected to the humanity within yes. the story. You know, you go and see Coronation of Popea, mm. and you think, well, actually, this could be happening today. You know, that, that kind of the power struggle, all the rest of it, or something like La Traviata, which is just such a heart-rending story that it never, ever fails to touch the audience because it's just those quintessential em emotions. Because it's always, always, always about the human being. And we have that connection no matter what. We can do what we do and be successful in it, extraordinary in it, but the core of our being and existence is that we connect from a human perspective, regardless of where we come from, how we look, how different our languages are. That core connection is impossible not to have. And that's why these stories can never, ever, ever be too old to be told. That is why the beauty of this art form comes that every time there's a gift coming or somebody, an instrument, it, it renews. It's always being renewed. It can never be outdated. I mean, do you find it, do you find it an emotionally draining experience? I would imagine at the end of La Traviata, you've been on such an incredible journey, you know, amazing highs, incredible lows, you know, torn apart emotionally. I mean, yeah. do you kind of, do you feel like you've been sort of wrung out at the end of it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Usually I'm a calm person, I'm a happy person, but when I sing Traviata or when I sing Romeo and Juliet, I don't know even who I am, where I am, how I'm feeling. I have feelings that, I, that are not mine, that, I, that stay with me even after the curtain call has gone down. When I'm walking the streets back to my place, to my apartment, I feel certain feelings that are not mine. I didn't understand that actually the impact of these characters on us is huge. And probably we don't talk about it much, but it's so important because it is the core of our mental wellness and our mental, our health being and our well-being. I remember Angelo Gobato used to say, Pretty, you're gonna have to learn how to separate yourself, your own being to this person who doesn't have a body you give body to them. You give them their, your heart to cry, to laugh, to, to be angry, to be desperate. All those things are real in your being. You, you avail yourself to have the, the, the desperation and the hurt and pain of that person or the joy of that person. Because I realized when I play Elisir or when I play La Fille du Regiment, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happiest. All oh, that run, I'm going to be happiest. And you're alive at the end. You know, I don't get to <laughs> die. That's the thing. That with Traviata or those, those characters, I feel like incredible sense of depression and 
lows that I never know are possible. And then luckily I have the support of family, I have uh, support of people who know me and they will say, no, that's not you. Come back, come back. And then slowly the person's um, essence, you know, become, uh, um, you know, not so much yours. But that's the thing with acting. That's the thing with the things that are happening with actors and us. Suddenly we are feeling things that are not ours because we've availed ourselves to those people. But now I'm learning to, to be able to differentiate when I'm not feeling well and I'm asking myself, is it me who's not feeling well? What was happening yesterday? What was I doing? Because then I can talk to myself and say, no, that's the uninvited guest that were invited only for that moment. Those are not my feelings. It's so important because we spend most of our times on our own and it's very easy to lose yourself in the, in the midst of that. Mm. I almost think it, sometimes it must be rather like being a doctor when you've got to, you can't get emotionally involved. I mean, you really can't, it would tear you apart. You know, if you're caring for people you know are going to die. I mean, that must be terrible. But in a way, that's the same sort of having to build this emotional wall between you know, the two lives that you, you know, you, you kind of operate in. I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you sort of stay grounded amidst all the, you know, you know, f during a run, for example? I mean, do you gather people around you or do you go for solitude or? I pray a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I pray a lot. The core of my being is my faith because I come from a Christian family and uh, that has truly been a very, very, very important base for my being because otherwise it's a roller coaster of emotion. I travel so much, there are lots of highs and there are lots of lows and there's so much pressure on an artist, especially now with the internet and everything is fast, you cannot do anything safely and everybody has something to say and, 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 and. So really being a Christian has helped me to have that core of a base that even if the world gives me glory or takes away the glory. I have something much more that is constant. And I've always also tried to um, not to be alone too much. I was going to say loneliness yeah. is something that people don't often imagine, yeah. you know, a singer at your level would experience, but I'm sure it's, there must be intense loneliness. It's very, very intense. Before knowing what I know now, it was excruciatingly, excruciatingly impossible not to feel lonesomeness because creators need that space actually of solitude to be able to create and we get pregnant while we're creating and then we give the baby when we perform. And then we have to deal with the post, <laughs> you know, um, depression of having given the baby and then you feel empty again. So that psychological understanding of dealing with the unseen world is very, very important. And I was able to understand that afterwards by people who saw me being somewhat not how I am because I spend so much time on my own, I'm taking so much pressure and, 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 and they're able to just bring me to myself and make me realize that I can be in a solitude kind of place but not ex actually being lonely because there's a difference between, between lonesomeness and being actually lonely. You can be alone and not feel lonely. Um, and so, it is interesting because it is a journey of solitude in a way because you do need that time to find out what's inside. Mm. And in order to be able to do that, you do need space. But that space doesn't have to then change to be your worst enemy. I mean, you're, you're best known as, a, as an opera singer, but I mean, you know, oratorio is there, song. I mean, are these, are these areas that, you know, maybe song, the song repertoire, is that something you would you would like to say, right, actually, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to clear my calendar for a couple of months and I'm going to, I'm just going to do song recitals because it has the advantage that I'm working with somebody night in, night out, so I'm not alone. Yet it's, it's a wonderfully, it's a wonderfully kind of intimate I art love form. It. I love it so much. I've always, always incorporated um, recitals in my repertoire 
And now more often than not, I'm also adding oratorio because I love, I love singing oratorio and uh, song repertoire. Also because I, when I started, I said, when I heard the music, it, it gave me so much joy. And I come from a family of sharing. Our country is big on sharing what you have. And when I felt that, I was like, I need to share this with as many people as possible. And then I understood also that the way I was being prepared from South Africa, you know, I have to be so versatile in a way as, as much as possible and as, as healthily as possible that if there's an audience member that doesn't actually necessarily like opera, but they would rather go to an oratorio or a song recital, I can be there for them. So then I can share my, my gift with everyone. And so it has been a big, big part of my, um, uh, of my career, not to just to, to do and Presumably operas. song repertoire takes you probably into the German repertoire more yes. than your operatic world. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's so interesting for me because I don't sing much in German, but uh, when I do, it's interesting you know, as a language, and because uh, it's quite different from the Italian and the French. But when I meet German-speaking uh, uh, natives or coaches and see their passion, they ignite in me the same passion as well, how poetic their language can be, the sounds, the consonants, and the colors that my gift can be able to also contribute in that German repertoire. And also, um, the song repertoire allows you to sing in English as well. Oh, and yes. singing in, singing in, you know, I, I would say your first tongue, it's probably your kind of first equal tongue or maybe your just second, second tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Which for me, actually, English is the most difficult to sing in. It's absolutely challenging. And Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. For example, for me, French, when I work on a French piece, is the most fastest uh, work process ever which is very different from my colleagues. They find French difficult. But for me, English is the most difficult. It's the most difficult. Actually, as a result, I don't sing much in English. Because <laughs> you've sung, you've sung Porgy in, in Porgy and Bess. That was like so long a ago. A lot million years yes. ago, yeah. So I've sung Porgy and Bess, but I know that there are English pieces that I would like to sing, maybe in the future, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, Porgy and Bess is always a tricky one because you know, because because the, the you know it has to be a black cast. You know, if it's going to be done professionally, I always feel slightly sort of uncomfortable about it, as it's this sort of weird hybrid. And to me, to me, opera is utterly colour blind. I mean, I have never, you know, it doesn't worry me yeah. at all or, or confuse me because you know, if you if you think about opera, the thing you've got to be, you've got to believe when you sit through an opera, you're thinking, well, actually, the, the colour of someone's skin is the least of my problems here. I'm still trying to get my head around the fact that you know. He is her brother-in-law, who's actually his aunt, who's killed his, you know, and all that sort of stuff, you know. I mean, I mean, do you find that there's, I mean, do you find an openness or, what I, I guess what I'm saying, is, is, there, is there an innate racism still within the operatic world or do you find it's more, more comfortable these days or is it a, 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 a I don't know. <laughs> I think that, you know, when I, and I have to thank my parents for this, as I said at the beginning, that because of how I was raised, I never thought that I'm different than you or the person next to me is different than me. Hence, my, my journey has been about exploring the impossible, really. And if I had thought of that way, probably I, wasn't, I was not going to even think of doing or accepting to do the Bergkantia repertoire. Mm. That's the beauty of the art form. Yeah. that it goes beyond the black and white notes, as I said. And the unity of those melodies are a pure example of why the core of any one existence under the sun is a human being. So good to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's the sort of immediate future hold for you and then maybe the long-term future? I mean, do you have sort of, you know, milestones that you think, well, yeah, actually, I'm, I want that. And at some stage, I'd like to do that. And at some stage, maybe. Well, absolutely. I'm very, very happy that my dream came true to sing Traviata 
I love that role from the beginning. From and the that beginning. will presumably stay with you now it will, forever. It will probably me, be with me quite, quite a long time. And, uh, but also I'm, I'm growing, you know, into also looking at maybe Faust, Marguerite, maybe a Mimi is coming in the, you know, in the mix. Um, but also still in the country repertoire, my, my dream, voice allowing, is to do the three queens, Maria Stuarda, for example, and Anna Bolena. I'm not sure about Roberto Dovere. We'll see. But the, these first two, I think it will be quite interesting for me to, to embark on. But ultimate dream is to sing Norma one day. That will be an ultimate dream. Definitely the Puccini is going to be a big part of my repertoire as well. How far do you think you could go into Puccini? I believe that I could be a Tosca one day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think Because if you look at the sort of, you know, we, we mentioned Franey. Yes. That's, that's certainly within I think well, certainly within Tosca her reach. will be wonderful one day. One day. Well, not soon. One day. Mm. I'd like to stay a girl. I want to enjoy being a girl and as much as I can because... You know, you can always go forward, but you can't come back, you know, when it comes to... Mm. to, 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 to and, and, and are you conscious of the voice changing? I mean, do you, how do you, 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 do you suddenly sing something and think, wow, that was actually really quite easy, or that's a note I didn't know I had, but actually it's there. My voice teacher, um, um, David Jones, actually um, realised that the past couple of four or five years or so, I've been going through a transition with my voice because things were just not working. Everything I knew was just not cooperating whatsoever. <laughs> and then she was like, no, pretty, your voice is developing, you're growing. So we need to do this. We need to do these vocal exercises. We need to, you know, have a look at this, have a look at that, and see also the roles that you've, th you've been doing uh, before to how they feel now. And in that, he resolved a lot of issues that I thought, I'm losing my voice, I can't sing anymore. And then he was just saying, no, you, you are actually in a transition. So you, you do feel it, you do feel it. And luckily with having a voice teacher that is able to say and see that and be able to help you to navigate through that is actually very, very important. And, and, and do you keep going back to? Always, always, yeah. always, um, always. Because as I said, we are doers and we do so much that we don't always have the consciousness of knowing that we are still doing the right thing because we have so many million things to think about and, and moving from one place to the other. So when you have those extra ears, I'm very, 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 very um, adamant now to be always in contact with him. Before I sing or doing a role, I always uh, do fra phrases with him and he would say, okay, with this role, you need to think about that. With that role, we need to think about that. Also, just doing Traviata from the very first time I did it here in the new production into the recent one, there's been, they were all different. They all, they all felt different from the one in Paris to Barcelona to Palermo to the one in, at, in Covent Garden. They feel different and I'm sure this one coming up now in San Francisco will be different too because the voice really, really changes a lot. And presumably every time you do it, you know, you, with, a, with a role that kind of, you know, has coloratura elements to it, I always think, you know, you hear a singer sometimes and they're doing the coloratura and you just think, well, it's just like a firework display. There's no real reason why they're doing it. And then you hear a singer where the coloratura actually comes from the text, from the emotional state they're in, and you just think, oh my God, that's, that's kind of what it's all about. It's not, it's not, as a friend of mine used to say, it's not canary fancying. It's really from the core of your being. It is absolutely from the core of one's being because it is quite an extraordinary expression that the the, the, the composer even didn't have words for it. It was only the soul that could express it through the coloratura. I remember, um, you know, singing Traviata now, just now in Covent Garden, when I was doing the Sempre Libera, it felt different. It felt different than just wanting to do the coloratura. It felt like she just wants to dance and to be free. And I twirled and I, and stuff like that. But it was unconventional to some people. They were like, why is she twirling so much? Because they're used to having it done a certain way. Those are the other risks that I need to take to have courage to do because as I'm doing that person in that particular place, I need to honor 
what they are saying in that very time. I had never thought I would be able to do that, you know. And so it's important to also be, to be very, very conscious of staying true to what you, because you know what you're feeling at that time, and you need to honor that. So you're here in Paris. Yes. Last night was your, your first night of, of in Pamina and Salba Flirta, you got eight or nine performances ahead of you, sort of nicely spaced out, sort of yes. three days apart. How do you kind of pace your time now over the next few weeks? Do you have kind of quiet days or do you just treat, you know, oh, it's a day off, I'm going to go sightseeing or how do you do it? It's a little bit of both. <laughs> I'm very excited to be doing Pamina, actually, because I've had quite a hectic schedule. So to be able to start my new uh, season with this role, in this beautiful, I love Paris very much. I am always happy here. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm in a space of rest and, and preparing also just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But um, it's been beautiful sunny days in Paris. So I walk a lot outside and sightseeing and just being out and about and breathing new So you're not one air. of these sopranos who races off to do a quick Mozart Requiem here and a Verdi Requiem there and no. a quick Schöne Müller in there between? I've tried to, to not to be that singer because ultimately it's one body and it's quite limited. Now and again, yes, but not often. Because, hmm. yes. I mean, it is, it is your instrument. I mean, you know, if you mess it up, that's kind of it. It's my responsibility, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A question I, I tend to ask most of my guests on this is, if you weren't a musician, have you any idea what you think you might, might be doing or would like to have done? Initially, I thought I would be an accountant. <laughs> that didn't, did that come from a love of accountancy and no. figures or just, I need a job? <laughs> it was like, you know, when you look at the careers, what's the job that's going to give you most money? <laughs> and I was told that being an accountant would be one. And at the time, there were not quite a, a lot of black accountants. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm one of them. So maybe I'm going to be an accountant because I was very good with mathematics mm -hmm. and business economics. I was actually a top student for my, for my studies. I had gotten an actual scholarship to study accountancy, but then I chose to do music. But when I think now, I love cooking so much that I think if I went a musician, I would really, really be an amazing chef. Because, I mean, the great, great thing about, you know, your job is that, you know, you're in Paris this week, you know, in a few weeks' time you'll be in San Francisco. And in a way, it's an incredible way of connecting with different cultures is through their food. It's the most fundamental way of connecting with other people is, is sharing meals. Absolutely. We're always in servitude, always, and with joy. And, I mean, I can't imagine my life without music. I would have had a very different life. And with this path, it has given me so much. I feel so enriched as a human being. I have learned so much and I'm, I'm learning even more and meeting so many wonderful people everywhere I go. And just that connection and to know that the world is so big. You know, I come from a very small town, so I didn't even know that the world is so huge and so big. And so I'm very grateful for each and every, every part of my life because that has really enriched me as much as I hope that it can enrich anybody else who, come, who comes across my path. Pretty, thank you so much for your time. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, James. Are you more comfortable surrounded by Silence or noise? Silence. If you could choose the sound of your doorbell or your ringtone, what would it be? <laughs> what could it be? Ah, Lucia's cadenza. <laughs> <laughs> what is the sound you wake up to? Birds. If your life was a movie, um, what would your sort of theme song be? <laughs> theme song. Mm, you know, Magic Flute is in my head right now. <laughs> Something from Magic Flute. What for you is the most relaxing sound and what is the most irritating sound? Flute. 
relaxing. <laughs> Irritating? Mm, I don't have it. <laughs> What's, what sound reminds you of home? Birds. Quite a few birds that remind me of, of home. What is the first sound you remember hearing? The sound of my grandmother. <laughs> what sound makes you think immediately of a, of a happy place or a happy memory? A waltz. It makes me always happy. <laughs> and what for you is the most musical sound not made by an instrument? Birds. <laughs>